Hello and welcome to this video tutorial brought to you by tutvid.com. I did a recent tutorial where I covered my retouching process and just kind of the 12 steps or so along the way that I take to retouch any given photo, uh, particularly though my portrait work. Um, and this is going to be the first of a 12 part series where I talk about each of those 12 steps and kind of explode them out into little individual tutorials so you can get a really good look at how I like to retouch my, my location portrait photos uh, in particular, but really some of the techniques and thoughts behind why I'm doing what I'm doing, they can be applied to virtually any retouch. Now, before we jump into it, I'm selling a course over on tutvid.com all about how to retouch images and some of the things that I like to do and really get into depth uh, with regard to some things. Check out the link in the video right here. You can check it out. I got a ton of info over there on that as well. So first and foremost, I'm going to have this raw file available for you to download. And before we jump into the first step, which is going to be the camera raw process, Processing. We have we shot a raw image with a Canon a DSLR, and we're bringing it into Photoshop. And the first step is the the actual raw processing. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about how we, how I shot the photo and some of what I did to shoot the photo. Uh, and to further explain that, I've got a blank file here, which is going to allow me to just kind of draw and sketch and show you what I did. So let's just say, uh, first of all, it was like 6:30 in the morning. So 6:30 a.m. Uh, we were shooting in Philadelphia, and it was the light was very soft, pretty much everywhere. You can sort of see the glistening of the very low sun in the sky as it's coming up over the horizon hitting the sides of these buildings uh, that's cool but what we did is it was just one simple light so I had her standing like right here um, and my thought was I wanted I wanted the background to be out of focus but not too out of focus so I shot it I believe at I think it was f8 actually um, but it was f8 at something close to or around 200 millimeters. So what that did was because she was so far away from the actual city skyline, something like a mile and a half away from these buildings, despite the fact that I shot at f8, the buildings are still somewhat blurred because we the, the focal length of the lens was so long at 200 millimeters, she's so far away from the actual background that we're shooting her in front of that what f8 is going to do is it's going to ensure that she is tack sharp, front to back, totally in focus, and we get a little bit of blur on the background. This isn't like an F12 kind of blur where we get no uh, no definition of features in the background. We can tell, if you're familiar with Philadelphia, you know that this is the skyline. Well, they're building another building right here right now, but uh, you know that this is Philadelphia if you look at the photo. So that's first and foremost. We're shooting about F8, and I think I would have been shooting at probably like 1 125th uh, per second at an ISO of, I don't know, I could just throw an ISO out there, probably ISO 200 or something like that. When we look at the raw file, we'll see for sure. Uh, so I was shooting her, you know, so I would have been over here, and actually I would have been somewhat somewhat distance from her because I was shooting at 200 millimeters. Uh, and then all we had was a huge Ellen Chrome Octabank right here, camera right, uh, hitting her in the face that way. You can see that the light over here is coming down like at this angle, and that's because we had our Octabank right over here off camera. All right, so you can see here, this is where the Octa was. Uh, lifted up on a C stand, pointing at her and just, you know, hitting her with some nice light. And I was using my shutter speed to balance the little bit of light that I had coming out of this light and the ambient background light, right? So I don't want the background to appear too dark, but I don't want it to be too bright either. So I worked with the power coming out of the light. I also worked with my shutter speed a little bit to boost or reduce the ambient light there in the scene. So that's it. It's a pretty simple shot to get. Um, and I know you tuned in for a Photoshop tutorial, but for the photographers out there, I really just wanted to explain, take a couple minutes and explain how the actual photo uh, was shot. So with that in mind, Let's get started with the actual raw file that, that we shot right here in this instance. All right, so you can see here I've got this 1-6.dng. I'm just going to drag and drop it into Photoshop. And by the way, .dng is sort of Adobe's digital negative format. Um, I was converting everything to DNG at the time. I don't really do that anymore, um, but I was doing that at the time. And I don't really do it anymore because, it, I don't know, I, I just stick with the .cr2 if I'm shooting with Canon. Um, and we can see over here, in fact, we did shoot at f8, 1 one hundredth of a second, an ISO of a 100. And oh, well, there we are. We're shooting at 90 millimeters, actually. But I was shooting with a 70 to 200 lens. So 90 millimeters at that, that distance, and then the distance of her back to the backdrop gives us just such a nice, just slightly blurred background. All right, so let's talk about what we do here in Camera Raw. Now, my general approach in Camera Raw is reduce contrast, 
bring back detail. I don't want my shadows to be dark. I don't want my highlights to be too bright. I would rather have total control over doing that in Photoshop. So first and foremost, before I even get to messing with temperature and adjusting sharpness is my contrast slider. So I'm going to pull back on the contrast slider until it looks kind of disgusting, right? It's just super flat. It's not really looking all that great. Shadows are still a little dark. So maybe what I'll do is I'll either boost the shadows if that doesn't quite look right. And you want to be careful. I don't want something that looks like like this. This looks bad. You just know when you've made kind of all the dark areas of the image, not just the shadows, but all of the dark areas in the image really, really bright. I'm not really a big fan of that. There are things that you can do in Photoshop if you do boost all of your shadows that much, though, um, but I don't want to do that. I'm just going to give a little kick to the shadows and maybe even a kick to the blacks. You got to be careful boosting the blacks too much because it tends to give you this faded effect with your photo, which, you know, sometimes you may want, but for the most part, you probably don't. Uh, so there we go. Boost the blacks, reduce the contrast. Um, I can hit the letter P to get a little preview of before and after. So there we go. We've really killed off a lot of contrast. And at this point, I will probably also, whoops, I'm just bumping my Wacom tablet here. Uh, I want to boost the overall exposure a little bit. I'm just keeping my eye on her highlights and also the histogram here. These are the highlights you can see. I don't want them way over here and becoming total white. As long as they're here, I know that I still have detail up here in the brightest parts of the image, at least on her skin. That's kind of important to, to keep an eye on. So I'll boost my exposure a little bit. I'll check out boosting the whites, or maybe I'll even decrease the whites a little bit. Remember, with an eye toward reducing contrast, that would mean boost your blacks, reduce your whites, that kind of thing. Uh, vibrance, I may want to reduce vibrance just to, just a kiss. Uh, and then temperature we can play with and see what does blue, what does orange look like. I kind of like it right around where it mo was. Maybe make it just a, a drip more blue. There's a touch too much green in this for my liking. Um, so I'm just going to add a little bit, tint a little bit of that magenta to suck some of that green out of there. All right, so once we've gone ahead and made those changes, sometimes I'll come in with the point tone curve. You may be seeing parametric. I always work with the point tone curve. Uh, sometimes you may need to come in and specifically uh, enhance or, or, or dehance or brighten or darken specific parts of your image with your uh, with your curve here. You can also play around with the color channels. Great. I do like to do some initial sharpening, usually somewhere between 80 and 90. If I double click my magnifying glass, it'll zoom me in. Hold on my space bar. I can just uh, check to see the sharpness levels we've got. It looks good. Um, I'm not going to play around with noise reduction. We were only at ISO 100. Any noise that's there, I probably want to keep it. I'm going to double click the hand tool to bring me back out to just fit the image in view. I don't need to really make any HSL or grayscale changes here. Um, something that you could do uh, sometimes when you have a photo with a lot of green in it, you'll want to mess with the yellows hue because there's a lot of yellow in your greens. And maybe you want to make those, uh, whoops, not greens. What am I thinking? You want to make your yellows a little bit more green. But one of the things that I would caution you is when you're working with a portrait specifically, there tends to be a lot of yellow in human skin. So just keep that in mind. You don't want your person to look like, you know, a uh, skinny Hulk or anything like that. They can tend to start looking pretty green and it's not the greatest look. Uh, saturation can be cool as well. Obviously, you can boost your greens, or in this case, if I really didn't like any of the blues or even the blues here in a dress, I could just reduce the, uh, the the saturation value in the blues and really get you know add gray to her dress and gray just overall to the image. I don't really like that. If anything, maybe bump the blues up a little bit. And then luminance works the same way uh, if we need to brighten or darken any of those parts. And actually, maybe just a, a little blue boost looks pretty good. All right, we're not going to talk about split toning. I hardly ever use it. Lens correction can be cool. If you just tick it on, a lot of times camera raw, as long as you're using any of the major cameras and, and major lenses, it's going to have a lens profile for that specific lens, and it will use it. See, it knows that we used a Canon. We used the, the 70 to uh, 70 to 200 f2.8. Great. And it has a profile for that. And we can play with the distortion. It'll give you automatic distortion correction. I may boost the vignetting toward white a little bit, see if we can get rid of some of that up there. But I know we're probably going to have to use the graduated neutral density filter tool, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, color, we don't have to really worry about the fringing here, but just know that you can remove chromatic aberrations if you've got them. Uh, dehaze, this essentially is going to add contrast to an image like this. Contrast, and you can see uh, sort of saturation. I don't like that in this case. Again, we want to control all of that in Photoshop. Another thing that I like to do that can tend to help with uh, reducing contrast is the camera profile. The camera neutral profile really tends to be one that just, it just takes a little bit more contrast out of the image, tends to just give you a little bit more depth and uh, a dynamic range to play with later on in Photoshop. And note that you can also go in and start a color grading process by influencing the color of the shadows to be green 
or magenta. You can see that really changes the way the image looks. And you can also play with your red, green, and blue primaries. Uh, there's some fun stuff you can do in there. So that's probably it uh, for all of the controls here in Camera Raw. One of the things that I will do is grab that graduated filter tool, like I said, and just Command minus, move out a little bit. I'll set my exposure to like, I don't know, one or two, and I'll just pull this in up here on the corner and I want to be pretty careful about it because like there I can tell something's going on. There's too much brightness up there. I just want to influence that little bit. Just kind of like that. You can see I'm just moving back and forth a little bit until it blends pretty nicely. It looks like I also have just a touch of something up there. That's good. Alright, and what I can do now, I can get out of this tool, just go back to the hand tool, and that looks pretty good. There's not really anything else that I absolutely want to get rid of uh, in terms of the camera raw dialog box. Obviously, it's taken us a few minutes to explain this, but once you get it down pat and you know what you're looking at for your images, you're going to be able to blow through this so quickly. And remember, this would have been like one of two or three hundred photos I shot of her. The lighting condition was the same. We were using one light the entire time. So in theory, I could save this as a preset or just copy these settings and paste them on every single other camera raw image that we shot that morning and you know boom in five seconds all of your camera raw images are updated now to open this up in Photoshop one of the things that I like to do and one of the things I want to show you here is your workflow output settings here workflow options uh, Adobe RGB is great I like to work with a 16-bit image it just gives you a lot more leeway in Photoshop if you want to resize it you can resize it I'm not going to do that uh, I also like to open in Photoshop as a smart object. And you'll see our button here is going to change from open image to open object. Hit OK and then hit the open object button and our camera raw process is finished. We have this image in Photoshop just the way we want it and we're ready to go on and take care of the rest of the steps in this tutorial. Now one of the things that I should point out to you because we open this as a smart object you can always go and double click on the thumbnail and it will reopen the image in the camera raw editor with all of your settings. That's part of the reason that I like to work with it as a camera raw uh, or excuse me a smart object so I can always go back to the camera raw editor later on. And we're going to talk all about how we make this work with our retouching and how we retouch non-destructively. It's going to be a beautiful thing. You're going to love it. So this is just part one of 12 steps to retouching images here in Photoshop and how I like to retouch. So for retouching images in Photoshop, the way that I like to retouch images in Photoshop. That's it. Get it? Got it? Good. Nathaniel Dodson, touchvid.com. I'll catch you in the next one. Hey, wait, before you go anywhere else, I'm bringing the intensity. I'm bringing the alacrity. I've been slaving over a hot microphone for the last two hours making this video. You got to at least hit the like button, right? And after that, if you haven't, make sure you hit the subscribe button. That way you'll never miss another one of these fun-filled videos. Also, go over to tutvid.com where you can sign up for my newsletter. And just for signing up, I'm going to give you 30 free time-saving tips in Photoshop. You're going to get it. It's a video. It's a PDF. It's everything you want it to be. And I'm also on every social media platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. I got links down in the description of this video. You can follow me. I love you guys. And thank you for watching this video.